You're listening to Accounted For, the Canadian podcast that explores the intangibles of every career. I'm your host, Daniel Lee. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Accounted For. Happy Hump Day and Happy Wednesday. This podcast is brought to you by OMD Ventures, my platform focused on everything human capital investing. Check out weekly articles on redefining the status quo in work and life, as well as my daily learnings on being healthier, wealthier, and wiser by subscribing to the newsletter on oldbendan.com slash subscribe. And also please help the podcast out as well as a friend you love by telling them about the podcast and giving them an episode that you think they would like. Also, please help the podcast improve and grow by filling out a survey that I made. I would really appreciate it if you can fill it out. And it should take no more than five minutes, and you can also remain anonymous. So please make the time to head on over to oldmandan.com slash podcast with an S. And you don't have to write any of these links down right now. I will provide the links in the show notes, so no worries. And so today's interview is with Jamie Rosenblatt, who is the principal at Golden Ventures, an early-stage venture capital fund located in Toronto. Jamie started his journey as a philosophy major and got hooked into the world of capitalism whilst at the JD MBA program at Rodman, so you're getting your law degree and your MBA at the same time. And he actually planned on being a professor of philosophy, but instead he became an, I guess, kind of quote-unquote, unintentional capitalist by becoming a technology lawyer by bringing in a client and we cover how he decided to take the I think I would I would assume what was then and still is potentially on unpopular jump of joining a startup when he had a great law career going for him and how it really isn't as scary as people make it seem to be from the way that he breaks down the logic behind it and we also talk about what is the dirty secret of venture capital and how he goes about building his relationships because that's something that I've been constantly looking to build upon myself and he walks me through his process and it's just been very helpful for me as well. And so this was a really fun conversation and it was great speaking with someone like Jamie who just who had such a clear thinking process and I think you can just see that or I guess hear that when he goes around like answering the questions that I ask him. And so I really hope that you find this conversation as enjoyable and fun and I guess even thought provoking as much as I did. And so here is my conversation with Jamie Rosenblatt. Hey everyone, welcome back to Accounted For. Today on the podcast, we have Jamie Rosenblatt. Hey Jamie, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Jamie here is the principal at Golden Ventures based out of Toronto. And so Jamie, for our listeners who may not be familiar with the venture world and your company, can you tell us a little more about Golden Ventures and what makes you guys so special? For sure. Uh, So we are a venture capital fund based out of Toronto, but investing across North America. So you can think of us as sort of the earliest professional or institutional capital that will go into a company. So a few administrative details so that it sets the context, and then I'll explain a little bit more about us, uh, add a little more color. So typically we invest somewhere between 500000 and $1.5 million uh, up front into companies, and we'll reserve um, a two to one. So for every dollar up front, we're reserving $2 on the back end for things like uh, bridge financings, et cetera. Um, and, and so we'll typically, uh, in exchange for that, get somewhere like 7 to 15% ownership. Uh, so typically the pre-money valuations are going to be below $10 million. And so that's really the, the, the beginning of the journey for companies. That's when we'll invest. And so uh, when you look at our portfolio, we've invested across. So we're on our third fund now, which is about $72 million under management. And so when you look across those funds, we've probably done in the neighborhood of 40 deals. Um, we were uh, fortunate enough to be... Uh, able to support some amazing entrepreneurs right from the beginning of their journeys, including, uh, you know, companies like Skip the Dishes or Ritual, uh, Top Hat, Wattpad, etc. So it's um, a really exciting place to play. It's a really messy place to play, um, but that's part of the fun. And so a couple of things that may differentiate us vis-a-vis um, other early stage investors or other venture capital investors generally. Um, 
you know, I'd say that humility and empathy are at the core of everything we do. Uh, I think it's really important to try and add value uh, when things are not going maybe super well as when things are going very well. We like to think of ourselves as um, a high value uh, part of the highest value partner on your cap table. We like to think of ourselves as the person that you sort of call uh, late at night when things may be, uh, you know, you may be a little bit stressed out about but whatever it may be. And a lot of that can be attributed to the fact that everyone on the team either has deep operational experience or has been a founder who exited the company, uh, exited the company themselves. Um, you know, there are other things I can point to that I think differentiate us, but I think that will get teased out during this conversation. So Yeah, definitely. And I think... A- common sentiment I've been having or I've been hearing uh, from interviewing other venture capitalists or other entrepreneurs in Toronto has been that Canadian venture Canadian investors in general are more conservative in nature and I just wanted to hear your thoughts on what are your sure. uh, thoughts around that so uh, I think if um, when you think about venture capital generally okay so here's a couple of things about venture capital to justify your existence as a VC, your fund needs to return at least 3x whatever your you know assets under management are. So if you raise a $100 million fund to justify your existence in the eyes of LPs, i.e. to be above median benchmark returns, you need to return about $300 million. And so venture follows something called the power law of dis- uh, or follows a power law distribution of returns, meaning that the vast majority of your returns are going to be derived from relatively few number of companies in your portfolio. And what that means is your successes need to be really, really big. And it doesn't matter. Your, your failures to some degree don't matter as long as you have really, really big outcomes. And so, you know, to be risk averse and to be in venture is sort of um, incompatible to some degree because you need to be comfortable with the fact that some of these companies are going to be not so great and some of them are going to be massive successes and so you need to and it's the massive successes that matter so you need you can't be risk averse and be sort of in my mind um, a a top tier early stage investor how it manifests itself i think in canada and where that reputation comes from to some degree is the fact that there's probably a disproportionate number of fintech or b2b or enterprise type investors in canada And so I think when people, what they read or describe as risk aversion uh, may actually be just a preference for a specific type of company. And so as a result, you know, if I'm a consumer brand or consumer startup in Canada, I'm, I'm, you know, coming up and I'm looking, I'm saying no one wants to invest in me. Why? You know, they only do B2B SaaS, like they're risk averse. So for us, we're sector agnostic. Uh, And as proof, I submit that, you know, we've done everything from a temporary tattoo company to a, a photonic-based quantum computing company. So if you can do temporary tattoos and you can, you can do quantum computing, then you're comfortable sort of investing across the spectrum. So, um, you know, that reputation, I'm not sure whether or not it's founded. Um, I'm just offering a potential narrative for why it exists. Uh, but I, I don't think, uh, you know, any top performing venture fund, you know, is scared of risk. They just appreciate that it's part of the job. Yeah, and I, I remember you telling when we first met, we talked about how, you know, the goal the goal of the venture fund is you have you want to deliver at least like three x sure. on, on the fund itself but many never really like reach that mark and yeah the it seems that i think a benefit of people investing in venture like private equity is the illiquidity aspect of it and i think from my experience in public equity that's been a big thing where you know, it's just a great way to lock up people's money so they don't lose out to their own psychological biases of fear and kind of selling out when the market goes down and you don't have that kind of issue I think as much in venture because your fund is kind of what locked up for 10 years is that yeah, the typical yeah way? so I mean that's an interesting take um you know there's a lot to parse through there but uh um, yeah so the average fund uh length is somewhere in the neighborhood of, let's call it 10 years you know there may be extensions that you can you know appendix to that or not But um, the general point or the general sort of flow is the first three years of the fund are when you deploy capital into new deals. So we're concentrated, um, meaning that we would probably do about 20 deals per fund. So, you know, do the math. Let's say it's seven deals per year for the first three years of a fund. And then you're working with those companies to grow them and and help them sort of succeed uh, on on a larger scale. Um, I've never considered illiquidity uh, an asset. Um, You know what I mean? Like uh, it's 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 part of the the nature of the beast and it's it's a a fact that you have to deal with in the sense that if you're a five-person company you know uh, at the time of investment there's going to be a long 
period of time or a long sort of sea of uncertainty that needs to be navigated before an outcome that, you know, everyone describes as happy and, and great. Um, and, you know, during that time, uh, yeah, sure, your cash is, is your investment uh, amount is locked up, but that's just part of part of the journey, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and I, so I remember I, was, uh, I kind of did a very high level of crunching of the math on that one. If your fund returned like three times over 10 years, it's close to like what, like a 12% return rate or something like that? You mean IRR or? Um, I was just doing yeah. like KGAR over it. So, yeah, I mean, it, um, yeah, something like that. Yeah. 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 And so then I guess the goal, though, is just to get as many X or like 10X in 100 Well, I mean, it, it, well, sure. The, <laughs> the, the, the more, like any investment, uh, the, the more of a return you generate, uh, the better. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think your general point about, you know, for some people, uh, they, some of them don't generate those sorts of returns. Um, I think that's valid. Uh, and, and that's just, uh, if, if nothing else, more motivation to sort of take stock of what you're doing and think about, you know, am I longer term going to be able to, um, break into and be a part of those, um, fund managers that, uh, are able to create value for everyone in the ecosystem longer term. So, mm-hmm. and so, you know, right now you're a venture capitalist, but your background, is also quite, I found, um, unique and interesting in that you first you first started off as a philosophy major yeah. at western this and is then, true yeah, yeah and then after that you went to you know ut to be uh to do the mba jd program yep. and to eventually become, become a corporate lawyer but what take me back to philosophy yeah. why, why philosophy i i have friends who do philosophy and I, I found there are kind of two distinct groups like i'm not trying it's kind of a generalization but it's been either people who actually love philosophy like they love the philosophers mm-hmm. they want to learn about all these concepts and actually learn how to think and there's been a group that just did it because they said uh, I was, you know, my average wasn't good enough to major in something else. I just picked philosophy. I thought it would be sure. easy. And I've taken philosophy before. It's nothing easy. Like, sure. It's really hard stuff. No, I, I'm so, uh, yeah. Uh, where do I fall in that spectrum? Yeah. Um, for, I was very interested in philosophy, uh, you know, late in, in high school, I started reading, you know, a whole bunch of, um, philosophical books or logic based books or whatever, you know, getting exposed to, I think like, um, early days was like, uh, um, what's the, um, you know, this is what happens when you haven't studied philosophy, uh, in, in a little while, but like Camus and Sartre and some of these existentialists, um, that's sort of your gateway drug for philosophy in some respects. It's what most high schoolers, uh, identify with. Um, if, if you were to pull them, um, you know, in any event, so read that, I got really, really interested and I found that it was sort of opening my mind to some stuff. And so I knew when I went to Western that I was going to major in philosophy. I knew it from the start. And so that's what I did. Um, I thought I was going to be a philosophy professor. I thought I was going to study largely ethics and logic. I thought those would within philosophy, those were the two areas that I was most interested in. Um, I'm not particularly great at writing essays, um, despite the fact that I love to read and I love to write you know, essays, I just, you know, I get inside my own head, I write forever, right? So, um, you know, philosophy was a natural, so I think philosophy actually was incredibly valuable in this job for a couple of reasons, because when I took these formal logic courses, in addition to basically, you know, getting uh, marks for playing, you know, intermediate level Sudoku, because that's what symbolic logic kind of feels like sometimes, I what it helped me do was abstract away from specific content to specific logical structures and then understand whether or not an argument that's presented to me, regardless of whether it's about, you know, let's say quantum computing or temporary tattoos or marketplaces or SaaS, whatever the business model may be, it's almost irrelevant. It's just, you're presenting a large logical structure. Does your argument, does the evidence that you put forward support the argument that you're making? And so given that we're um, sector agnostic and I see a thousand companies a year and they cover a whole bunch of different categories, it's incredibly advantageous for me not to get bogged down in the weeds of specific nuance and being able to at least start from a position of does the argument that's being presented to me make sense? So that was why philosophy was incredibly powerful for me early on. And it was also a natural segue to to, uh, law and everything that came after. Okay, and so this kind of framework um, is it? Is it does it have a name? Like is that is it like a framework that's taught to you, and they say, okay, this is a kind of logical framework that you want to? Look no, at? I, I mean it's 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 general logical argument. Um, and so if you were to take if you were to go say like look up a symbolic um, a symbolic logic course, uh, what you would learn there are what are very uh, various logical fallacies. Um, you know, 
mistakes in reasoning, cor- like the most obvious would be things that everyone has heard before, like correlation doesn't equal causation. You know what I mean? So uh, those sorts of just being aware, A, of logical flaws in thinking and then being aware of what sort of hygienic, good logical arguments look like. And let's call a spade a spade. Like I work in, a, in an industry with massive information asymmetry on all sides for all stakeholders. And so when you think about these companies that come in here, uh, all they can do is uh, they, they effectively have a view of the world and how it's going to evolve. And they're trying to present an argument for why, you know, uh, I'm going to want to order a dog walker off an app instead of, uh, you know, uh, via phone or whatever it may be or through friends. Right. And so they'll submit their evidence and they'll say, and this is why I think it holds. And then the rest of the experiment when I, after they get funding is to see whether or not it does in fact hold. Right. And so. Um, Step one for me is, okay, do I, do I find your argument compelling? And part of the way that I assess that is whether or not I, I see a logic to what you're telling me, right? Like, does the evidence support what you're trying to convince me is the state of the world that you're going to bring about, like that it should be brought about? So uh, there's no formal name for what you're looking for other than to know that logic has structure to it. The way people express their arguments, uh, it, have, it can be good, it can be bad, it can be other. And so, yeah. And you also mentioned about how there's just so much information that's also available in the space. And as part of your due diligence process, when you then look at these investments, when when is it enough? When do you feel, is there, can you give me like an example yeah. of when you determine that, okay, at this particular situation, you felt it was enough due diligence to proceed and make a decision where you were comfortable? Yep, yep, yep. Um, so uh, there's a delicate balance between um, a few different variables, right? So on the one hand, I need to have enough evidence to feel that uh, I'm confident enough or have the conviction to make an investment. Um, and you need to balance that against a um, the uh, scarcity of an entrepreneur. Like you need to respect an entrepreneur's time, right? They have a lot going on. Fundraising is not generating, you know, additional revenue dollars for them. So you don't want to be overly burdensome. You want to get to your answer one way or another as quickly as possible and being as efficient with their time as possible. Then the other thing is, you know, um, Sometimes it's a competitive round. Other people want to invest. And so you want to be able to move quickly enough. And so you need to be good at setting priorities as to, okay, this is important for me to know or not. I'm not just going to try and know the answer to everything, right? I just need to zero in on those things that matter and get confidence around there. So, you know, um, as an example, like uh, let's use a company in our portfolio called BenchSci, um, which is a platform that allows uh, bench scientists, so research scientists, to effectively uh, select I call them the ingredients that go into experiments, but think of it more along the lines of like antibodies, reagents, et cetera. And so in that space, um, part of the way that I got conviction around uh, whether or not this was solving a real pain point was by speaking to academic laboratories uh, about, um, you know, the reproducibility problem uh, is what they call it. But like this idea that it's really, really hard to determine what the appropriate antibody to use in a given experiment is. And so while I may not know a ton about antibodies or a ton about conducting research in the, in the life sciences, speaking to experts in the field was my shortcut. I was able to have blunt conversations with them. I was able to ask them questions around the pain that they were experiencing and how BenchSci had solved for that. And it became crystal clear very quickly that they were really hitting on an important point with people that aren't easily convinced uh, that tools are better than good old fashioned science type of thing. Right. And so, um, you know, I used the opinions of experts in that case to very quickly get the confidence I needed to make a decision one way or another. Mm. And in terms of the speaking with experts and f- figuring out who is an expert, mm-hmm. when, when I was an investor, I, I was actually doing, um, some research in the medical device space and I have no background in any of that. Sure. And so I had to find people who are medical researchers or doctors in the States to ask them about different kinds of um, tubes that they'd put into people's hearts and pacemakers and catheters and ask them, what, what is all this? Do you yeah, use yeah. it, et cetera? And how, how do you know, how do you determine that someone's an expert, especially in a field that could be so much more further advanced or it's very nuanced? Yeah, so um, a couple of ways. I, you know, there, there are there are a variety of ways that you can engage someone uh, that you think is an expert, right? You could ask the company to make introductions to existing customers. You could, uh, and then the other thing is, you know, just to, you know, uh, if you think about uh, venture capital as part of the job is to remain well networked. And if you're going to build a thesis in a certain space, part of that work is going to be done by 
doing your own research, uncovering people that you think are well-educated in the space through your own research, reaching out to them, and then validating some stuff and, and working that network yourself. Try to build it organically. So it comes from a combination of different places. It can come from the entrepreneur who's trying to pitch the idea. It can come from your own research and subsequent uh, network building that happens. It can also come from leveraging your portfolio. Part of what's interesting about investing across a broad spectrum of companies is that you now have a broad spectrum of expertise to draw on. Um, similarly, when you invest, uh, when you when you make a point of building out great venture capital and investor relationships, now you can have these diverse syndicates of, hey, that's the robotics expert, or hey, that's the person that loves to invest in drones or or into blockchain or whatever it may be. And so now uh, I see something in that space. It sounds interesting to me on first pass, and then I go knock on their door and say, hey, you've spent a lot more time thinking about this space. Here's what I'm seeing. Does this pass your sniff test? So. Um, expertise uh, can be engaged at a number of different sort of vectors, but those are a couple that that, that we've leveraged in the past. Mm. And that's something I, I would like to dig into uh, more in, a little later, but I want to kind of go back to mm -hmm. the point that you mentioned about how you, know, you were so dead set on sure. doing philosophy in university and you thought that you'd be like um, a, Prof, yeah, yeah. a professor or something. And then you told me that, no, but philosophy was a great segue into uh, your law yeah, sure. career. And yeah, yeah. so... You, you did the the MB, the joint MBA and JD program. So was and was that like the inner kind of super high achiever in you that said I'm going to do both yeah. because people decide you know usually I think my my friends are right now deciding am I going to do law or MBA but you decide to do both. What, yeah. what happened there? So um, uh, it's interesting. Uh, there's a, uh, so here. Um, I decided to go into law. Uh, I thought I was going to go more into the, like the human rights side and like government work. That was the initial uh, intention. And I actually only enrolled in the law school. Um, and then early on, um, I had other friends that had um, enrolled in their MBA uh, or had done the JD MBA, but were a couple of years ahead of me. Um, done the combined program that were a couple of years ahead of me. And so the more I sort of, I had looked into it high level, um, but in the U.S., you know, you required a certain amount of work experience. And in Canada, that was a more flexible option. So I wrote the GMAT. Um, fortunately, it all, you know, went really well. And um, so it was sort of on a whim. I was like, wow, I can save a year. I can get both of these degrees. Like business sounds kind of interesting. Let's open up my mind a little bit and see what's out there. Um, and so uh, I did that. And, uh, and so um, – to answer your question, you know, I got into law because, again, I thought I was going to be a lawyer, a human rights lawyer. I was going to go into sort of government work. And then I, on a whim, because of some encouragement from friends, uh, wrote the GMAT and, and got into the joint program. And then after my first year at the business school, I was like, holy smokes, um, capitalism is the greatest human good that I've seen in a long time. Uh, this is really, really interesting. Um, I'm a utilitarian, uh, like you know, when I think about my own personal ethics, like the concept of, you know, what's generating the greatest good for the greatest number of people, that's sort of one of the key principles that motivates my thinking. And so I see capitalism and I see how many people, are, you know, there's never been a famine in a country that has sort of full flight, you know, uh, late stage capitalism. Um, and I think about like all the good it creates. And yes, there are huge negative externalities that regulation can, can whatever. But I was like, this is awesome. And it also, I'm an intellectually curious person. And then I get to see all the different things that you could do with a business degree. And next thing you know, I'm hooked, uh, start, you know, looking at, um, end up working with, uh, Kevin O'Leary and Alex Kenji at O'Leary Ventures, um, involved in their Shark Tank and Dragon's Den deals. Um, and then sort of go into corporate law at Osler, Hoskin, Harcourt. I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit. And then I end up doing, you know, I'm the head of corporate and business development for a company called Avid Life that's doing about $200 million a year in revenue. And then, you know, I'm, you know, so on and so forth. I, I sort of just launch into this corporate, very business focused uh, career. And it's entirely as a result of the first year uh, exposure I got at the business school. It, it radically changed the... Um, the, the direction I was going to go in. Do you, was there a particular inflection point? I, like, for example, like a specific course, or did you yeah. meet some people that just completely radically changed your mind or read a book? Like, what was it? Uh, that's a good question. I'm trying to. So, I, uh, one of my professors, uh, Ajay Agarwal, uh, went on to uh, start what became, I guess, the most successful, uh, or one of the most successful, and certainly one of the most important uh, incubators, accelerators in Canada, uh, called uh, Creative Destruction Lab at the University of Toronto. He's also had one 
uh, professor of the year like 10 times in a row or something absurd like that for his corporate strategy class, which was extremely demanding and all the rest of it. But, you know, just seeing the sophistication in his thinking and the structure that he brought to messy problems, because business isn't business isn't math or just, you know, it's not uh, number theory or physics or anything like that. It's not not to say that those are, are, are not messy in themselves, but like it's not, you get this weird set of data that you don't know what to do with sometimes. And if you don't have structure to your thinking, you don't know, you know, how to approach it and, and you're clumsy. Right. And so oftentimes I'd look at business problems. I wouldn't understand what I was seeing. And so what, what was game changing about that course was it really gave me a toolkit to leverage and build on or a foundation, you know, to actually navigate messy data and real world experiences and, and really become a systems thinker and understand how, one group's actions impact another and how to sort of structure yourself in the world. So um, I think the strategy classes in particular had a huge impact on me. Finance was super interesting. Like um, I love like the nuts and bolts of the numbers, but like the strategy side, it really helped me sort of open my eyes and achieve this clarity. When I see business problems now, I kind of get how I can attack them. Everyone told me that's what would happen when I went to law school. They'd be like, oh, you learn how to think like a lawyer. I was like, this feels a lot like philosophy. Right. Like I didn't really see there was no real like aha moment for me where I was like, I feel like I'm thinking like a lawyer. Uh, when I went to business school, I was like, holy shit, like I'm thinking like a business person. <laughs> like this is crazy. Um, and that was really exciting for me. So. And you, you went, when you went to business school, you talked, you, you just briefly kind of mentioned how you did your undergrad and you didn't have, you know, you didn't think you have enough work experience, but you figured oh, Canada's festival is tried out. And then you do your, I guess, what's your first internship at with Kevin O'Leary? Yeah. And, you know, people don't just get to work with Kevin O'Leary just because they want to. So how, sure. how did that kind of come about for you? Yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah. So when uh, that came about because, uh, so the JD MBA U of T at the time, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but uh, it was very small year to year. So it was about like eight to 10 people max sort of thing, sometimes even smaller than that uh, per, per year. And so it was a really close knit community. And so alumni um, would host barbecues at their house and everyone would go. Uh, and Dan Debo was uh, one such individual. He's gone on to become a prominent, um, super successful entrepreneur, investor in, in this ecosystem and someone who, you know, I think is a, a great example um, for, for what, um, you know, a successful along virtually every dimension career path could look like. Um, and so we were in his backyard and, uh, I remember, uh, I had met this guy, Alex Kenjeev, uh, who was an alumni from our program and was working as the president of O'Leary Ventures and sort of managing all of Kevin O'Leary's sort of businesses, Shark Tank and otherwise. And so, you know, and exploring new opportunities. And so we got to chatting and, um, effectively, uh, I said, you know, we stayed in touch and he's like, there may be something, uh, maybe an opportunity. Uh, let me keep you uh, in the loop. And then sort of we followed up a few months later and there was an opportunity to, to work with, with him and Kevin and, and the team and, um, you know, did that for somewhere over the summer and then, you know, for, for a period into my uh, third year while I was in at school because part of the fun of a four-year graduate program is uh, your workload is drastically reduced uh, as you get closer to graduation. And so did a bunch of interesting things there and I call it my introduction to venture, but really it was probably an introduction to reality television more than anything. So. <laughs> and, but after that, you went full-time into becoming a corporate lawyer, yep. despite what you talked about, how you felt that you went to law school, you didn't really end up really thinking like, yeah, no. like you're all about business. You're like, this is the thing to yeah. do, but why go back to law? So corporate law is, is there, I mean, you know, there's, there's the law that I thought I was going to do human rights, international law, that sort of stuff. Uh, and then there's business law, which is a lot more businessy corporate law. Um, and so Osler was a great launching platform to sort of develop legal skills, to develop um, sort of uh, some like the the at the intersection of business and law, those skills like understanding like business organization, uh, how you set up um, a, a corporation, tax considerations, um, the basics of uh, mergers and acquisitions and, you know, what provisions matter, et cetera. More practically, uh, I can tell you exactly what went down. It was, I, so Ajay was my professor. Um, you know, he told me about CDL. I asked him if they had any legal representation. He said no. And I said, would you be interested or open to Osler representing you? He said yes. 
And so as a result, I got to hand or bring help bring him on as a client of Osler. And uh, what that meant was Jeff Tabor and Chad Bain uh, effectively became my mentors. Uh, and they were the leading technology lawyers in Canada. And so um, I had the best situation of any young lawyer that I knew in that I got to do exactly the work that I wanted to do for exactly the people I wanted to do it for. Um, and I wasn't, and despite that, I wasn't super enthusiastic about the work, which was great in some respects or freeing in some respects, also terrifying in some respects, because I knew that this wasn't the career that I was ultimately going to do for the next 20 years, um, because I had the best situation I could possibly have. And I still felt like there were, I felt too remote or distant from, um, having the sorts of impact that I would want to have in, in the business world, right? I felt like I was sort of being transactional on the, the, the papering of deals and, you know, the success of the company was too far removed from the actions that I was um, actually doing, if that if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I, I definitely I can definitely relate from uh, being a accountant and consultant. You always being that kind of professional service person. Yeah. You always kind of far. Yeah. I felt I felt pretty far removed from it, even though we would tell ourselves that yeah, no, exactly. we're, make, we're making a lot of change. We're without us, they wouldn't be able to do it. But you go, really, is that really so the case? And it's not to discount the value that I mean, like. If anything, I've grown to appreciate the value of service providers, um, in particular lawyers, given my background, but like grown to appreciate their value immensely over time. Like those that are good at what they do play an extraordinarily valuable role, even if that role is or the value of that role doesn't become apparent until something goes wrong. Um, those that are good at it are worth their weight in gold. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were, you were actually the first, I think, lawyer to come on my podcast and it's, it's a world I'm not too familiar sure. with. I started with, yeah. like, I think like most people, I watched Suits, yeah, right. the TV show, and I thought, is that law? And then I met a few corporate lawyers who were telling me, no, that's not the case. And I actually briefly spoke with a corporate lawyer back when I was in consulting, and uh, she, would, she would argue with me about words in a contract for one of our consulting cases. And she was telling me, no, 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 you can't say we will deliver it at this day you can't use that vocabulary yeah. and all that i think is part of the reason do? sorry say again no and then i was thinking is is that what a lo corporate lawyer does i wonder what yeah, she actually right. does most of her days um so what i'd say is that like that sort of small vignette that story uh, that you just told is a great example of why people often think that lawyers would make uh, really poor venture capitalists because they get into the weeds about stuff that doesn't matter they're risk averse, they're pessimistic, all of these things. And to some degree, that's probably true. Um, you know, there's certainly, I've met tons of lawyers who feel that way. Um, you know, fortunately, I don't lump myself into them or else, uh, you know, I've chosen the wrong career. But, um, you know, what do they do? If, if your question is, what do they do all day? Um, a lot of it is there's a lot of administrative work at the junior end. But then once you get a little more senior and actually managing clients, you are acting um you know, the general counsel is another thing that you'll call a lawyer, your counsel. And a lot of it is providing, you know, counsel to your clients who want to do something on the business side and you're helping them understand the ramifications, both from a legal as well as a risk perspective um, and, and how to sort of uh, measure their actions within that framework. So, you know, I want to acquire company X. It's like, well, have you thought about the liabilities that you're taking on or the tax implications here? or you know what that means from an employment law obligation perspective so you become very strategic and relied upon for a number of things um, other good lawyers will do you know like any other uh job they have to drum up business so maybe you have so they, they say there's like grinders minders and finders that's how they describe lawyers they say that the, the grinders are the one that put in the grunt like really spend a lot of hours slaving away in the office you know, doing some of the administrative stuff, doing all the like actual drafting of documents, etc. You know, minders are like the sort of brains that are are constructing like novel tax structures, etc. And then uh, finders are the sort of brain makers, the ones that are out golfing, schmoozing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, which sounds nice. Um, so, I mean, that's what they do, uh, I suppose, at, at the highest level. But, like, there's there's tons of super smart and talented people there. Um, you know, uh, somewhat biasedly, I think that there's too many smart, talented people there. And, and, and the world might be a slightly better place if we get them to try uh, some other stuff. Uh, you know what I mean? So Yeah, I, I had the same sentiment when I was in my investing world where I felt these people are super smart. I wonder what it would be like if they did something different sure. with how smart they are. And I think... Like Charlie Munger has been a huge uh, proponent of that, constantly yelling at people in hedge funds saying, you're so smart, you should do something different than try to make 
yeah, like 100 basis points. It's part of, um, you know, when people talk about the startup ecosystem in, in Canada, part of what they sometimes say is that we lack the business talent to scale a company from 10 million to 100 million people. And one of my pet theories has been, or one of the ways in which I think that we solve that problem it, uh, comes from the fact that uh, today is the first real time that uh, I'd say, you know, people who are accountants or consultants or bankers or lawyers or whatever it may be, traditional uh, professional services uh, professions with deep technical expertise in something have ever. This is the first time where, when they're looking to the next phase of their career, they're viewing tech as a very viable, very real, very desirable next step in their careers. And I get reached out to all the time from people who are looking to to make the next step. And so, I think, you know, um, timing is everything in life. And uh, I think that there's a whole lot of talent that is uh, open to being unlocked in the tech sector for the first time, which I think is super exciting. Yeah, and I, I definitely do agree with that. I, As I grab more coffees with all my friends, we're still in professional services. They'll, I'll come back to me and try to ask about, you know, Dan, mm-hmm. you talked to a lot of startups. What's, what's the hot one? Which one should I join? Where should yeah. I go to? And though I think a big thing that they constantly push back to me on is the, the kind of, quote unquote, golden handcuff that they have where they sure. don't want to lose the huge bonus or the big pay package and it's they're all so soft yeah I mean, like <laughs> the golden handcuff they're all acting like they're making like 10 million dollars a year i'm like all of you combined make less than like you know a minimum wage raptors player you know what i mean it's like it's a golden handcuff no it's like fake gold handcuffs right it's like oh i got a nice barely upper middle class life here like okay if that's all you aspire for then that's totally legitimate and i respect that but don't act like you know you don't act like if you leave you have to give up your maserati you know what i mean so i think that excuse is kind of hollow and it only gets worse so like i I, the best hedge against risk is youth none of us are getting any younger if you're going to try and do something do it right and the upside, by the way, is much bigger in, in, in jobs uh, or, or in early stage companies where you can actually own the equity. FYI, ser- you know, professional services firms are leverage based models, right? You know, they pump you for everything you're worth and then churn you out if you're not able to sort of meet the demands required to get to the point where you get to share in the profits, right? So I, I got no sympathy for people who are making like X dollars a year and feel like, you know, they're, they're, acting like they're on like Charlie Munger's level to use your, your words. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's, uh, if you, if you really want to give it a shot, like I think that you just need to think longer term and think bigger. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And so for you, when you were in that, yeah. that seat where you had all the things going well for you, but you still didn't feel that sense of kind of fulfillment yeah. and it was just at the level of maybe like just being content, how, what was the kind of decision making process that you went through with yourself to say, okay, I think. I'm going to leave this and join. Yeah. The, the hardest part about leaving was um, I actually really enjoyed the people I work with. I thought they were incredibly talented. I had a lot of very, very close friends at the time there at Osler. And, you know, Osler is an incredible place and incredible people. And, and so it was hard. It, it was most difficult to leave the people more than anything. Um, but I ultimately uh, knew that, you know, um, my career wasn't, I could still be friends with these people. That's not a reason to choose that professional career forever. So once I had made up my mind in that respect, I just started to, you know, leverage my network uh, and think about opportunities that were of interest to me. Um, The two that sort of most were most appealing to me were sort of in, I initially I was looking at going into consulting because I felt like, Hey, let me build out my technical tools toolkit a little bit further um, and then see that will just give me more optionality in terms of where I go next. Uh, and then I also had a natural interest in technology and, and startups and venture capital generally. And so those were the two sorts of paths that I was looking at, either going and joining a company. Um, I had tried to start a company when I was in business school. It didn't work out, unfortunately. Um, but maybe I would be a founder. Maybe I would join a company. Who knows? And so I, I just started talking to a bunch of people, led to a bunch of interviews and, you know, uh, met a ton of interesting people that uh, ended up playing pretty um, pivotal roles in in my career story from then on then on out so how did i think about it i thought about it in terms of why did i want to stay i recognized that the reason i wanted to stay was because of the people and when i thought about hey is that enough of a reason to stay i said no i can still be friends with these people i can still have relationships with these people and so let's discover where else i fit and that's what i did 
and I didn't know you tried to start a company back in university. So yeah, what, what was that? What was that like? How what was that journey? Yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 more of um you know uh, just a, a sideshow uh, to the main story at this point. But like, there were a couple of ideas, you know in 2011 or 2012, I guess at the time, the first idea was really around ZocDoc, um, trying to be a fast follower to that model. Um, and then eventually uh, spent a lot more time uh, and, and talked to a few VCs at, at one point about, uh, we called it, I think, Syndicate. And it was effectively, and now I laugh because I've seen 50,000 other people try and do this and every time it was like, oh, FYI, it's not gonna work. Um, it was what, you know, Tinder was to Facebook, uh, it would be like Tinder for LinkedIn. It was just a, a straight up networking platform, right? Uh, this was, you know, Tinder had launched three months before. It was, we built an MVP of it. Um, we onboarded, uh, you know, a couple hundred users uh, within our networks and we were trying to see like how it would work. And one of the things that we realized, one of the insights we realized were, was everyone was trying to network up. Uh, there was a ton of incentive for the juniors on the platform wasn't a ton of incentives for the senior people on the platform. And so anyways, um, the, the engagement wasn't what we thought was, was uh, enough to keep it interesting to us. And so it ultimately just sort of fizzled out um, and we sort of all went our separate ways. But yeah, so that's the story. Hmm. And do you, do you find that that's the case for most, like you said, other people try to follow something similar to that you've seen a bunch oh, trying yeah. to fill. Yeah, yeah. Is that the big kind of barrier that they tend to hit? It, I mean, um, so, well, okay, dating apps, I can tell you a lot about uh, this specific idea, which is more of a networking app. Um, that's one of the core problems that I think uh, people have had difficulty solving for, i.e. the um, aligning incentives so that all stakeholders get their value out of it. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of sort of uh, sector agnostic problems, let's call it. It's like, hey, what's your customer acquisition cost, right? Like, hey, what's your single player utility until you have enough people on both sides of the of the market, right? Like job seekers or or, or, or senior, junior talent, whatever the the, the 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 chicken and the egg are in this case. Uh, you know, why am I on there until there's enough people that I can just keep swiping forever and, you know, it doesn't get stale? Like, why else am I on there? Is there content on there? Is there something that keeps me engaged? Why am I coming back, right? So, I mean, those are problems that a lot of apps in that space, social transactional space um, experience. Um, but I also think that uh, aligning incentives, like, you know, why does the CEO want to be on and not just, you know, product manager, junior product manager, junior marketing person trying to get to the next level in their career? You know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, but uh, I haven't spent a ton of time looking at that space since. But, uh, yeah, those are my sort of gut feelings. Yeah. No, it's, it's funny just because I have, a, I have a developer friend who reached out to me saying, hey, have you thought about a Tinder for a LinkedIn people? You talk to yeah. a lot of people, then why don't you just make a company that way? And I thought, yeah. it's not that easy. I don't think it's, it works no, that way. I mean, yeah. 2012 tried it uh, and didn't work. Uh, I've seen lots of people try it since. And I mean, there's coffee meets bagel and there's all this other stuff out there. And so, I mean, there's probably a way to make it work, but I haven't been compelled by any of them to this point. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And so then now you, you left Osler, you found the right opportunity, you went to Added Life. Was, was that still... Are those kinds of moves um, kind of was it common or popular when you were a lawyer, or do most people stay in law? Yeah, or because yeah. like when I think about consultants, most go to like Fortune five hundred yeah. big ops, or even if they go to technology, they will go to big branded tech. They'll go to like Uber or Google, and they totally. won't go to startups because it's just it's just not common for them. Uh, I'd say the most common. So um, most lawyers stay lawyers. Like most exit opportunities are to companies to remain as lawyers. And um, you know, of those, it will. Uh, it depends which firm you're coming from. But at Osler, as an example, you're going to go to the big banks and the, the Fortune 500s because those are the clients of the firm. Um, for those people that leave law to do something besides law, the most common are banking and um, consulting by far. Uh, and so the, my move to become the head of corporate and business development for like a fast growing large technology company was highly unusual. And to be perfectly honest, uh, it was one that was, um, you know, probably ahead of my skill set at the time, although, you know, I pride myself on being a fast learner and all the rest of that stuff, but it is definitely unusual to have, um, that opportunity placed in your lap, which is part of why I was motivated to sort of take the opportunity. Um, but yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't unusual. Uh, it's not unusual to leave, you know, a law firm to do X, Y, or Z. Uh, I'd say it's relatively unusual to go straight into a business role um, that's completely, um, you know, divorced from law. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? 
And you also mentioned how Avid Lab was kind of a pivotal point in your career as well, and it was very important. Why, why, why would you say that? So, um, I, so uh, two things. One, uh, what was pivotal, pivotal, pivotal uh, was um, that period when I was in law. And I was meeting a whole bunch of people that would introduce me to various business rules. Um, that network that, you know, I met Matt Golden of Golden Ventures during that period. And he gave me the advice of, hey, why don't you go get some operating experience? And, you know, having that touch point with him then and then when we eventually synced back up, you know, was super important. Um, Avid Life was great because it gave me insight into understanding what, it, you know, what um, technology business looks like from the inside out. It had scale. Uh, it had resources, um, you know, it was expanding internationally, et cetera. There were lots of different lines of business. Um, I got to understand the politics of, um, you know, working at a company and understand sort of like how KPIs are set and, you know, what, how to think about like what shifts the dial in terms of, you know, this is a worthwhile business line or not. And so um, it was foundational because it actually gave me business experience rather than just textbook experience. And like you get to see the highs and lows of business and actually live, breathe it. And, um, you know, had my first direct reports. Um, so managing people and, you know, reporting directly to the CEO and all this stuff, like you just, there's certain, you know, it, it may be small individually, but in an aggregate, these are skills uh, and relationships that you cultivate that um, give you a lot of insight that you just can't get unless you do it. That's why some people are so biased towards the idea that you need to be an operator, you need to be a founder in order to be a VC, because otherwise you can't dispense super valuable uh, insight because you haven't lived and breathed it. So it just gave me a chance to live and breathe it. Um, so I think that's why it was so important. And you mentioned uh, in my pre previous conversation with you that one of the dirty secrets of venture capital mm -hmm. is that it's the people you know and sure. the value that you bring to companies is based on this kind of wide network and yep. people you can, introduce, you can introduce to the company. And I, I've heard the sentiment very commonly by other venture capitalists as well, like, um, I think Chris Saka was talking about build early and saying how if you want a CFO at a Series B company level, like, he, he'll know. He'll make a phone call. He'll, he can find five CFOs for you. And it seems that that is a very important part of being a VC. Yep. And it also seems like from your career journey so far, like you, you know, you met, um, you know, what your O'Leary opportunity came from knowing sure. people. You know, you're coming to Golden Metrics, it came from constantly maintaining yeah. relationships. How do you, you know, think about building relationships? Like, do you have a system of like maintaining them and focusing on, yeah. you know, I have to reach out to this person every six months or no. so? Like, yeah, how does it? How do you? I, think about I that? wish I was that organized. Um, I, I truly, truly do. Uh, I, you know, okay, my my system for networking effectively consists of whenever wherever I go, uh, whoever I meet, like I take a genuine interest in those people and. You know, I try and build a meaningful connection with them so that if there is a reason to reconnect or stay in touch, like, you know, I have that warm connection with them. I really just focus on like in the moment, um, are we talking about something interesting? You know, does this person sort of enjoy this interaction? Do I enjoy this interaction with this person? I'm really just focused on authentically building a relationship in that moment. And then I worry less about whether or not there's going to be any value to me later on. It's just like if we both walk away from that, uh, you know, um, interaction sort of happy, then I'm confident that I can reach back out if, if I need to, and then good things will happen. Um, I also am super curious. So I generally focus those conversations more on other people. Like this is a weird conversation for me because you're asking me a bunch of questions. Usually I spend my time talking to people. Like I've been told various things that have just resonated with me. I've never fully articulated them, but like the idea that, you know, you want to make someone like you, you talk about them. You talk about their kids, you talk about their dogs, their interests, etc. I'm very curious, so that's just sort of what I do anyways. Like when I meet someone new, I want to hear all about them. And so, you know, crack a few jokes, uh, share a few interests, and all of a sudden you got like a fast friend, right? So that's my approach. Authentically express interest in what people are up to. Use that to create a, um, a warm initial sort of connection. And then to the extent that, you know, there's a reason to, like continue to cultivate the relationship, right? Um, you know, uh, so that's, that's what I would say. But like, I also recognize, I'm not afraid to ask for help from my network. Like I understand the value of a network. Right. And so if I know that you're connected to X, Y, or Z, you know, I'm very respectful and responsible with, with 
with introductions. So if I'm asking you to make an introduction, I make sure that I'm on time for that meeting, I'm early for that meeting. And that's not something that I'm particularly known for. But like if I get a warm intro, I am going to treat it like gold because I want that. If, if you introduce me to someone, I want them to come back to you and be like, oh, thanks for introducing me, Jamie. Like that was a really great conversation we had. So that's how I, I think about relationship building. Anyone, I ask for help, and if they put me in touch with someone, I, again, really want that person to have enjoyed their experience and take something away from it, not just me taking from them. Hmm. Yeah, I think as, for me, as I've been meeting so many yeah. fascinating people, it's something that I've been constantly, personally just been struggling with in terms of, I want to keep in touch with all these people, but I also don't want to bog them down of, hey, do you want to catch up every like, six months or yeah. so, and eventually meeting more people and having to constantly meet catch up with everyone i meet a million people every week now, yeah and it's it's the best slash worst part about the job sometimes right like how do you how do you maintain all these relationships and so, so like the hardest part is saying no and and figuring out how to keep people engaged despite that right and so you know um sometimes it just doesn't make sense to catch up and that's okay like and 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 so just being thoughtful about how you use their time and thoughtful in your communications with them and sort of setting expectations about what 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 what's appropriate or not is helpful. So um, I, I think, so you, you allude to the dirty secret of venture. Uh, it's true. Um, and this is something that's empirically validated that networks are the most consistently proven value add that an investor provides. So that's like talent introductions, uh, introductions to potential customers to the next layer of capital. And so, you know, I try and think about my relationships within that framework and try to fill weaknesses in my buckets of, or weaknesses in my network so that I can continue to be a value add for for everyone that I'm investing in or, or working with, so yeah, no, I, um, yeah, it's something I think I I also have to constantly just be more mindful of and constantly yeah. work at, and yeah, it's it's a skill set to also I think constantly work on. And, for sure. Yeah, as we kind of hit upon like the final marks of our interview, for uh, sure. I have some closing questions that I like to ask uh, many of our guests. So for you, what's What's the belief that you have that you think goes against conventional wisdom, whatever that conventional wisdom might be? A belief? So, uh, yeah. Um, where am I a contrarian? Yeah. Uh, virtually everywhere. Uh, <laughs> Spoken like a true investor. Yeah, right. No. Um, I, I'm naturally a skeptical person, uh, and it, it's, a, it's a terrible trait, but whenever anyone talks with me with any degree of certainty, I immediately get my sort of uh, my claws out and I'm just like, why do you feel that way? Like I, like when anyone tries to tell me something that I, I, I don't, you know, I'm just very curious as to why I should believe them. Um, but, uh, that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm actually a contrarian in everything. Like I agree hardware is hard as an example, or logistics are hard. Um, I think that, uh, e-commerce to some people's minds, e-commerce um, is uh, not a fad, obviously, but like is is difficult and something that they're not super interested in investing in. I am still extremely bullish about e-commerce. I think that um, you know the vast majority of our transactions uh, will continue to move uh, uh, online, uh, where they're more frictionless and seamless. And so, I'm really interested in. I think that there are a ton of uh, opportunities that haven't been unearthed there. Um, I think that what makes them attractive in particular is when they are not leveraging sort of the traditional acquisition channels. They're not drunk with paid acquisition dollars. They have some means of community building and defensibility that's agnostic to whether or not Instagram rates go up. Um, so where am I contrarian? I'm a little bit contrarian in that respect. Um, I uh, am contrarian. I'm not sure where else. Uh you know, unfortunately, I don't have a great answer to that, but that's sort of the nature of the beast when you ask a general question. Yeah. You, you think of everything and then you think of nothing. So. <laughs> and who, who, who comes to mind when you think of um, the third most influential person for you, like a role model or a person you've actually met? The third most influential person to yeah. me. Yeah. Um, I, what is that? Is that meant to sort of discount like my parents and my spouse as like, a, like so, you know, knocking them out? No, I mean, so like my joke is like my professional, like if my if my hero is Michael Jordan, my professional idol was Brad Feld, um, who, uh, you know, is is sort of wrote the book on venture capital, literally called Venture Deals and, you know, is, is an LPNR fund and is is a world renowned investor via uh, Foundry. Um, you know, he's someone that um, has consistently espoused what I think are like core principles and tenets and conducts himself in a way that I uh from afar, uh, admire immensely. 
Um, I think that he has consistently put out content that um, it, it has, is filled with humility and empathy for the entrepreneur. Is There's a clarity to his thinking and the way he expresses himself that makes it accessible. He's not trying to outsmart you in any way. He's just trying to produce a point that you can leverage and use and action on. And I think I love people like that who, you know, um, are, are incredibly intelligent, but like don't use it as a weapon. They use it as a way to elegantly communicate stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think he's super interesting to me. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, uh, that's who I'd, I'd sort of cite, I guess. Okay. And finally, have we, is there anything we didn't touch upon that you feel like we should have touched upon briefly or you wanted to mention for the no, listeners? Yeah, well? no, I mean... Um, I just, so uh, I, I presume that the people listening to this podcast are probably interested um, in, you know, finding out a little bit more what about various career paths and, and roles and things like that. And so what I would say is for those people who are thinking about venture capital, here's a couple of things that you should know. Um, I think that it is a, a profession, it is a job that um, there's a lot to love about it. In particular, uh, if you're intellectually curious, the amount of uh, exposure you get to incredibly intelligent people, incredibly diverse ideas, cutting edge stuff is fabulous. It's the best part of the job, um, you know, but it, it isn't for everyone um, because you sort of go uh, six inches deep and a mile wide. And so, um, you know, really reflect on what it is that um, gives you satisfaction. Is it is it is it scratching the intellectual curiosity itch or is it, you know, you like a tight fit between your actions and the consequences they bring about, i.e. you want to be in the mix, you want to be an operator, you want to be a founder. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, I, I guess that's it. Like, uh, it turns out that I love venture um, and, and I'm very fortunate to have found something that I feel is, is a really good fit for me, but it's not a fit for everyone and that's completely okay too. All right. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Jamie, and thanks, thanks for sharing, sharing uh, your story with my audience. This was great. I, uh, I appreciate you taking the time. My, my pleasure. So thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please check out other episodes and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date for the future episodes. Also, I would really appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, whichever is applicable to you. To see past episodes, you can go to oldmandan.com slash podcasts. Also, you can sign up to my weekly newsletter on my blog, oldmandan.com slash newsletter. You can stay up to date with future podcast episodes that way. And included in the newsletter are my book reviews I write, my weekly article in the related to the domain of self-development systems, as well as seven things I learned throughout the week on being healthy, wealthy, and wise. Finally, special thanks to icons8.com for allowing me to use their music, Tiny People, on the podcast. Great. I will see you all next time. Take care.